So 391. Today is Tuesday, April 30th, and I'm King. And I'm Bitcoin Zay. And we're here to bridge the gap between cryptocurrency and the community Monday through Friday at 3 ish. At 3 ish. And today we have a lot of good stuff going on. Another dino of the day finally. It's been a long time, but we have one coming out of the UK. Central Bank Deputy Governor Dave Ramston, who is claiming that cryptocurrency is not a store of value. Then we will jump back over to Tether, where it looks like their own lawyers have said that they are only 74% back by fiat currency. Hackers have used Microsoft email accounts to steal users' cryptocurrency. A report has been released. Australian tax agency goes after crypto traders in exchange data push. And last but not least, BitPay has partnered with Refundo to enable, that is right, taxpayers to receive refunds in Bitcoin. But first, before we begin, who was the free crypto coin winner of yesterday? Ah, yes. So our free crypto coin winner from yesterday is PFC Wells, a.k.a. Hey, Trek. What's going on, Trek? Thank you. Thank you uh, for your answer to our question about Jaguar coin and whether or not you would use it. Uh, his response was that he believes it's a PR stunt. Uh, they're using it for, you know, more widespread adoption as far as marketing, and it won't be as used as, they, as much as they say. So thank you for that comment. Tend to think the same. A lot of big products use it for marketing. Um, and then we'll send you that free crypto coin. All right, Trek, much appreciated. Thank you for that. And this is the wrong story. As we mentioned, top story of the day, UK, or excuse me, not the top story of the day, but the dino of the day, UK Central Bank Deputy Governor Dave Ramsden is saying crypto is not a store of value. That right. is right. Dave Ramsden, Deputy Governor of the United Kingdom Central Bank, has said that the crypto assets are too volatile to be a store of value, a value, he made his comments in an interview with CNBC published today. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. This uh, guy, Bank of England Deputy to Governor again, Ramsden noted over that, oh, noted that over a year ago, the UK's Financial Policy Committee had concluded that cryptocurrencies' but uh, volatility meant that they could not be a store of value. Furthermore, the FPC also came to the conclusion that cryptos are not a practical medium of exchange because the cost of transactions was too high. Wow. I mean, you talk about dino of the day. Uh, I mean, you know we're breaking down this article. What's the opposite day? Or exactly. <laughs> I mean, first we're talking about the volatility of it. Like, it's mm -hmm. brand new. Mm -hmm. Calm down. Yeah. Calm down. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You'll be okay. You can wait another year or two to get it secure. Uh, but, but the cost of transactions, where did that lie come from, right? Oh, yeah. And one of the worst parts of his, his explanation was the cost of transactions, which Bitcoin is notoriously cheaper than Visa, MasterCard, and other forms of payment that you may have. Even if you do a wire transfer right now, a $10 or $20 fee from a bank is way more than you would ever have to to pay uh, for a Bitcoin or a crypto transaction. So this is why Dave Ramsden or people like him get laughed at, get called dinos by us, because for the most part, they, they use rhetoric to scare people. Their conclusion came at the end of a meeting with people we don't know. So we don't know who came to this conclusion. Right. And one of the things we want to make sure we put out there is that these people who are deemed as smart don't know what they're talking about with crypto most of the time. So don't know where he got most of this this from. And as a store of value, if you think about store of value, uh, let's say a generation, because that's what a store of value means, like real estate, gold, whatever. Uh, Bitcoin has been around only 10 years uh, and it's, it's grown over 720 million percent from the first time. Wow. That uh, sounds like a terrible store of value. Yeah, to me. I, that sounds terrible to me. 720 million percent. And I think it start, it's over it started a million. with 13 cent and yeah. we're at 5400 and it reached all time high at 20,000. Yeah. I but think it's a million percent since you don't want that. Yeah, no, you don't, you don't, you want, don't that. want that uh, <laughs> since it hit mainstream exchanges. So as a store of value, it's the best we've ever seen. But from his point of view, they don't think it's reliable because they don't own it. So right. you get this dinosaur of the day, much deserved Dave Ramsden. Right. Uh, and it's funny. You look at some of these comments. People are saying too volatile. Wow. Just like go. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. As you said, another commenter said, yeah, that upward volatility makes Bitcoin a better long term investment than a store of value. <laughs> Compare Bitcoin to just about any investment over a three year period. And not much comes close. Especially close. If you I think the only thing close to Bitcoin after a three year period, um, I mean, would be another altcoin. Yeah. <laughs> like, honestly, Pretty much. some of the altcoins we saw do 500,000% in a year or, or whatever, those would be the only ones. But uh, as you said, for this guy, uh, to still, as you would say, in our what did you say in our year, or in, our, in, in Lord, the year of our Lord, two thousand nineteen, we are still say, discussing Bitcoin as a store of value. It's we already we already killed that argument. It definitely is a good store of value. I always tell people if you keep it for at least three years, everybody has made money. 
Every single person. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and give, uh, what's his name, Dave Ramsden, the UK Central Bank Deputy Governor. Look at you. Mm. You're a second place guy. I don't know why we're listening to you. Let's give him that loud roar. We only listen to the real governors of banks. We don't know deputies around here. Give it to him one more time. There we go. There we go. Oh, he's screaming. I know. Oh, that's how they sound as they see Bitcoin price start to go up. You notice as the price goes up, the FUD's coming back again. Good riddance, Dave. Um, we don't need it. Except this time, the FUD is also coming with article. I mean, it's like one moment there's FUD, and then the next moment there's a banker saying, yeah, we might just open up a JPM coin in a trading desk starting this week. <laughs> so I don't know. Which one is it, Banks? You guys are on the same uh, foot anymore, it looks like. Oh, yeah. Quick shout outs. Uh, looks like that notification went out late because we saw people start to join as we were going over that first story. But what's going on? Christopher Ladd, Ryan Cooper, Coop DeVille in the house. Uh, Tessa, hello, hello. Ali the Architect, hello, good what's evening. What's going on, Cheryl, everybody? hello, Cheryl. How you doing? Top story of the day, though. Fractional Reserve Stablecoin Tether is only 74% backed by fiat currency, says lawyers. Oh, yeah. You don't say. That's what I'm talking about, Tether. And, and here's the crazy thing. They're saying only 74% backed by fiat. Uh, -uh. I want to know exactly how many United States dollars you have, mm -hmm. how many pesos you have, yeah. how many wands, how many yens. I don't know. What fiat are you using? You could be using... <laughs> Uh, uh, the Venezuelan uh, Boulevard for all I know. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want that. Which fiat? And then for the rest that they claim that they may or may not have, is this in precious metals? Is it in, in Mar? You know, is it in Marvel trading cards for Avengers? I don't know. Is it in Pokemon cards? Like, what is the rest of the value? But what's going on here? Like, oh yeah. Real quick, shout out to the photo. Coin Telegraph, shine that bright light over there on uh, on Tether. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like from the movie, uh, you, you know you messed up. Oh, yeah. you know you messed up. Well, uh, there's two big arguments going on right now about this actual story. Seventy four percent of Tether's reserves, which is you know the stable coin a lot of people use, this number seventy four percent has come under scrutiny from some people that say, hey, you don't have it one to one backed. If you if everybody turned in their tether at the same time, it'd be worth seventy one cent, I believe. The point of a stable uh, coin. The point of a stable coin is to be stable. Right, However, there's people on the other side that say every bank that has less than one hundred and ten million dollars only has three percent in reserves, and every bank over one hundred and ten million has ten percent reserves. So at seventy four percent, some people are saying that's actually better than banks. It's not a bank though. Exactly. Like, what are we doing here? Exactly. This is crypto. It's crypto. And if this it, is if, crypto. And if crypto, <laughs> if crypto has to stay one to one, that's what some people think. But some people think, hey, if seventy four percent is good enough uh, to keep it stable, then what's wrong with that? So you have both of those arguments going right now. However, my argument is don't say you're a stable coin. That's my only argument. If you only have seventy four percent reserves, call yourself a crypto bank. And then when those reserves won't seem as bad, you yeah, actually could say, hey, we're better than banks. And then you would have all the Ned Flanders who want to still use banks will probably use you. But when you say it's a one to one stable coin, your white paper instantly becomes invalid. Everything from that point of view will scare a lot of people. But I don't think everybody will turn in all of their tether at the same time. No. I don't think they can from a technological standpoint. They would just cut it off at a certain yeah, point. Tether wouldn't let them. Um, but their lawyer has admitted to it. And unfortunately, that is enough for the New York AG to have a case because they can say, hey, you lied to your investors. If you had all this extra money to loan, it could have came because of fractional reserves. So Tether's in hot water right now. A lot of arguments going back and forth. I can't wait to see what happens with this because this oh, was set a precedent oh, for every stable down. coin in the rest of, uh, of history. So it's, yeah, it's definitely going down. Um, and as this article says here, the legal battle stems from claims that cryptocurrency exchange Bifinex, which we covered last, uh, well, yesterday actually, mm -hmm. which shares its CEO with Tether, used reserve to plug holes left from a problematic outsourcing agreement early in 2018. So two things. Mm -hmm. First, you know, did you already know from the beginning that Bifinex and Tether CEO is the same person? Yeah. Because I know a lot of people didn't know that. Um, and then the second thing is, if this is the deal with Tether at 74%, uh, the way this statement is made, I wonder if it's at 74% because they did give that money to Bitfinex to cover down? Mm. Or was it already at 74%? Because that a lot, would, a lot of stuff to uncover. Right, it's yeah. a lot of stuff to uncover. But this goes back to the audit. This is why that audit was so important. Uh, and the fact that now that they're coming out saying we only got 74% of every dollar, then the auditor is right. And they should they could actually sue you all because if I remember correctly, Tether came out and basically was like, hey, you know, mm -hmm. they know they're doing, we wanted to go a different direction, we got rid of them. It's like, no. They did know what they were doing. They are correct. They found the things we wanted to hear, and then you fired them. And basically, I guess they signed the NDA where they wouldn't release it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out they're right. As you said, 
Tether would be in, you know, a better, I guess they'll be in a better place. They just came out and said, hey, we're banking, but we're better than banks. But yeah. we have a 75%, let's just say they said that. We have a 75% fractional reserve. And all we need is for a, a million people not to turn in their tether. That will probably work better as a bank. In fact, there is a bank that might steal that business idea and say, hey, if there was a way for us to convince people we could use digital currency like uh, these stable coins and we can have a better fractional reserve rate uh, because it's digital, that could actually work for a, a banking company in the future. So Tether has shown a few things. For one, they lied. They are insolvent if there was a run on Tether. Right. But they've also shown a way for banks to operate better because we've always said at the very least, if, if Bitcoin doesn't take down the entire banking financial system and there's anarchy or whatever, whatever, at the very least, it'll make banks better. It already has. It's already made them clean up their act in regards to fees and things of that nature. And as far as, uh, you know, coexisting, we can still do it. However, with uh, Tether, this is a bad look. It's a bad look. And, you know, it brings to the point, we were talking about Paxos the other day after the whole Bitfinex thing happened. It was like, well, we just printed off $10 million worth of Paxos uh, stable coin. And it's, again, it's the same with them. It's like, would do you have the $10 million that you printed <laughs> off or are you just printing it off <laughs> and trying to sell it? Like... Um, so as you said, it's going to be a good uh, use case, a good study case. It's going to set a lot of precedents. What happens in the stablecoin market? And the only thing that worries me, which is why they're really going to have to tether hard. I mean, think about this. Mm -hmm. This is New York people. They got. It's all about money. It is all about. If you think it's anything else but money, you are delusional. It's all about money. So. With that being said, for me, it's like okay, you guys in New York are coming down very hard on Bitfinex and Tether. And the only clear reason I can think of is because you're already in bed with the likes of Gemini and Coinbase. Well, yeah, Paxos. Uh, Paxos, all, all those all those stable coins that just started coming on the market, specifically Gemini's, mm. uh, their stable coin. Like, for them to succeed, they need to take out the person who had the first <laughs> mover's advantage, which was Tether, yeah. who has majority of the stable coin market, which is Tether, who everyone knows, which is Tether. In order for all these other stable coins, which we call it basically a billionaire's ICO, mm -hmm. in order for these stable coins to take off and for these billionaires, these bankers, and oh, these regulators and politicians to make all of their money back and get reelected, they need the likes of Tether to get out of business. Oh, yeah. Period and fast. Got to get them out of here. Um, so I think that, hey, while this may be true on Tether's end, Tether is certainly not the only one, A. Not even close. Uh, yeah. and, and then B. There's a lot of nefarious. Again, things. we said this yesterday when we were talking about Bifinex. I'm not looking at New York's attorney general like some superhero with a cape. They're another villain, okay? Mm -hmm. It just happens that uh, it's just two bad guys fighting each other. So whatever, no dog in this fight. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you now, um, you know, kind of as you say too, they're going to set precedence with this thing. Yeah. And they're going to try to crush Tether and then say, see, this is why you all need regulations for us to protect you from these fake stable coins. Now, this yeah. Gemini coin that we back, yeah. though. Now, <laughs> if somebody else trying to create a stable coin, see what right. happens. That's basically what they're going to tell people. So, right. That's unfortunate. Uh, and Ryan Cooper, I was laughing. Ryan Cooper said, first time I ever heard y'all screaming here because I just screamed. I was watching Stephen A. Smith. He gets some views. I tried something <laughs> different, brother. All right. Everything's off for the show. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not running around in real life screaming. Uh, but yeah, very interesting story. Can't wait. As you said, I can't wait to see what happens. It's going down. Now. It's going down. Uh, it looks like it's also going down in Microsoft. Hackers have used Microsoft email accounts to steal users' cryptocurrencies. It has been reported. Mm. Uh, it looks like email services like Outlook, Hotmail, and MSN uh, have affected several cryptocurrency holders affected by a recent hack alleged that the hackers responsible stole their crypto reported by Vice's motherboard. Mm. Um, first of all, if you are linking your cryptocurrency accounts to a Hotmail or MSN account, you have already been hacked. Oh, it's, man. It's those things have been hacked for like five <laughs> years, like all of them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care if you make a new one right now. Just get hacked. All yeah. right? like, you're, you're, on the hack, you're on the hack list. Yeah. Outlook, same with Outlook. Like, when well, you yeah. at work trying to go on your crypto accounts, I know half people listening like, yes, we actually are. Oh, yeah. I get it. Outlook, Hotmail, MSN, there aren't, those aren't the best services uh, to link, especially mm -hmm. as your primary account. And also, as a lot of commenters will say it in this article, will happen to two-factor authentication. But mm -hmm. um, how did this hack happen? Uh, what's Microsoft, I guess, doing about it? Yep. And how did it affect so many people? Uh, well, one of the victims actually came out uh, on Tweakers, uh, which is a forum that you could use called Javon Rittmeister. He stated that his Kraken cryptocurrency account had been hacked and that he lost about one Bitcoin worth of, uh, of money, which is about $5,000. Uh, he wrote that when he visited Kraken, his, password, his password didn't uh, work. 
And then when he searched his emails in Outlook, he got a, a bunch of notifications that stated his login was changed. And come to find out, his login was able to get uh, penetrated because he had no two-factor authentication on his Kraken account. The, uh, the unfortunate thing is they just introduced two-factor on Kraken, <laughs> uh -huh. and he did not have it on his account. Um, and, you know, a lot of other users have come out and said they've lost crypto as well. Uh, one uh, posted that he lost 25000 in crypto uh, for the same reason, hacked and deleted emails. And they figured there's something major going on with Microsoft Outlook. So if you have a Microsoft Outlook account, um, don't panic. However, if you don't have two-factor authentication on it, or if you presume that there's some sort of uh, some sort of security breach, you need to change it or move it. I don't know why you have Hotmail MSN, but you definitely don't want to get your yeah. Outlook breached. I think they. I'm being honest when I say this, but I think the only uh, people who are still using Hotmail were some of the ladies of the night back on back page when they're still going okay yeah. like no one's using hotmail people but scammers <laughs> like so if you still have it i know some people do they're like well, i didn't have this thing for 30 years yeah yes that's because it's been it's been hacked every year since you got it's it right? like stop it stop yeah. using uh hotmail and msn but all the hotmails on craigslist uh, yeah you know what i'm saying <laughs> according it sounds like they're on snapchat these days uh, according to microsoft the initial breach took place between january 1st and march 28th mm. again we have talked about this for a couple years now when we talk about those uh equifax has the deloitte hacks mm. the Do it was a Deutsche, one of those banks um uh, you know a few other big hacks that happened in the last year or two they always happen and it's just like when you find out uh, a month or a month and a half after it happened, and it turns out, yeah, you know, these hacks we've actually been hacked for three months at a time or six months at a time. Yeah, looks like that happened here. It's saying between January 1st and March 28th, that initial breach took place, though, according to others, it may have extended for six months. Hackers initially reached consumer emails via Microsoft, a Microsoft support agent account. So, uh Two things on this, you know, the first thing is, as we said, you know, these hackers are sophisticated. They will get inside of a system like Microsoft or some of the bigger institutions like uh, Equifax when they did them, and they will literally sit there for dormant. six months, yeah. a year, two years. Some, I mean, if you have a real sophisticated operation, they will lay dormant for three to five years before they actually execute the hack or whatever they want to do. They'll just sit there and just get as much information and data as they can, and then once they feel like they have enough, then they'll make their getaway. So... <laughs> um, this one is saying maybe six months, and then it looks like they got it through a Microsoft support agent account. More than likely, this is a social engineering yeah. uh, attack. If yeah. it's going through Microsoft support, I mean, they probably went through admin over there and they got yeah. one of their main accounts, which probably gave them access to a lot of other ones. Yeah, but. and it was non corporate, so they probably right. tied in a non corporate email with a corporate one. Usually, that's that's a failure waiting to happen for a corporate uh, company. So, Microsoft got to clean it up. Right. Got to clean it up. Uh, and last but not least about that initial statement, it looks like Microsoft told everyone that it looks like the hackers, uh, they made an email statement to affect the users, assured them that hackers may have access email metadata like contacts, but not the content of any emails or attachments. I'm not, I, I don't believe that. Yeah. If you're a hacker and you're good enough to get into Microsoft, or if you're a hacker and you decide to get into Microsoft, either way, uh, and you get access to emails, you're not going to just have metadata that's only content. That's not the way metadata works. Yeah, for one, so. and I, I don't think, yeah. I think they're just trying to lessen <laughs> right, the yeah. they're, Don't they're, worry, they didn't read all your terrible emails. In <laughs> right. yeah. they're, they're trying to see who's tech savvy from their email. They're like, look, you're still using Hotmail. We can tell you this. You're going to believe us because <laughs> that's not true. So... Uh, yeah, if you have one of those again, Outlook, MSN, or Hotmail, it may be time to uh, you know rethink that a little bit. All right, another big story: Australian tax agency goes after cryptocurrency traders in exchange data push. Mm. Wow, um, what is coming. right? What is going on with this craziness? Oh yeah, so Australia's tax agency, the Australian Tax Office, will seek to contact cryptocurrency traders personally about tax issues as a part of a new data collection scheme officials confirmed in a statement today the ato as it's called is working in conjunction with the australian securities and investment commission sort of like our uh, sec and they'll demand information from operations uh, at local cryptocurrency exchanges so the data will be used to contact those traders and they'll get a minimum of 28 days to explain the operations as they pertain to capital gains tax so australia basically hit up all the exchanges they say look we want all the data not some of it we want all of it give it to us 
We'll take that data. We'll find out who's using the exchange. And then we'll talk to them personally because we need our money. We basically are tired of waiting to see if you're going to pay capital gains. If we have, you know, thousands of people trading crypto, but we're only getting a few thousand in taxes, we want to see what's up. And I think this is the beginning of a larger scheme where Australia will start it and then another country will come out and oh, do yeah, it bigger. Right They'll learn from them and then it'll, it'll keep going downhill from there. So I think this is the road we're leading to with these mainstream exchanges and the data they're able to provide when you give kyc they can hand it right over to the government because they'll be scared out of business and once they do that uh they can do with it as they please and they'll figure out your capital gains tax for you right um i mean this is a scary uh precedent yeah for one, I, and i think honestly i wouldn't be surprised that the u.s is actually behind this or working with australia to use australia as a test ground first because we do those type of things mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, as you said, traders will get a minimum of 28 days to explain the operations. I love how this write up calls it, uh, you know, these tax issues as part of a new data collection scheme. Mm. I like the word scheme here, people. It is. Um, I mean, here in the United States, I'm, I'm sure everybody's seen the recent stories about how Amazon's getting around not having to pay any taxes, uh, as mm. well as other a couple other really big companies here in, in the country. And it's just one of those things where... All right, like stop worrying about us. If you mm. really need all this tax money, yeah, you can literally go to like two or three people in every country and just get all that right back. Yeah, uh, I'm sure they haven't paid it, but uh, as you said, this is crazy. I mean, how does that look in the United States? Let's well, say, that, well, that, honestly, it would take a stand. And somebody actually commented, Coinbase. They did stand up to the IRS. They okay. said they won't give their data because they know they're going to get they no know, more customers. No more customers. See, this is what I was trying to explain. Uh, you know, before we tried to explain is that. The only reason that IRS or these tax companies, the SEC, does this is to make their job easier. Mm -hmm. Because it, without that data, the actual trades and people's names, they would have to basically fish through a whole web of networks. They and different do their job. They would have to do their job, which yeah. would take years and years to find all of the crypto or however many crypto traders they're looking for at a certain threshold. Because I'm sure they're not looking for everybody. But if you traded over 100K, a million or something like that, they're looking for you. Um, and they want that data. They want to make it easy. And if these crypto exchanges listen to them, it will be easy. If they don't, then they just got to deal with it. They, can't, they can't, can't really shut it down. So uh, we'll see how that plays out too. Because some will stand up, some won't. That's right. Mike G says, stay scheme. Man, <laughs> I'm assuming it's from the song. That's why I sung it like oh, that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, imagine this though. How would this look? Uh, you know, in the United States landscape, let's say the United States came out today. So, you know, what? we're going to go back the last 10 years. We're going through all these exchanges. We're getting these accounts and we're going to get people 28 days. Like, I mean, wow. That would be like the that'd be, of, that'd be plenty of time for me to go. Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got to go bed. Right? Yeah, I'm going it. tonight. Yeah, Look. 28 days. Hey, what? That's you, plenty of time. They are. Uh, they're going to start seeing our live streams. going to be like weird animal noise yeah. in the back. <laughs> rain. Where, where y'all at? We in the jungle. We're Don't worry jungle. about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, but that's pretty crazy. That's true. Mike G said Donald Trump crippled the IRS silver lining. Uh, so very interesting thing about that, Mike G. Uh, a few years ago, back in 2016, before uh, Donald Trump was actually elected into office, uh, we basically thought that would happen. And one of the things we told people were that this would actually be one of the best times for uh, businesses such as cryptocurrency businesses because of what he was going to do when it comes to politics and IRS and all basically everything he's doing right now as far as keeping everyone's attention on the executive branch. We're going to allow small businesses and new innovators to kind of sneak away and do what they want. We're seeing that in the marijuana business oh, yeah. where all of a sudden, you know, government is not paying as close of an eye as it used to. Um, and again, I, you know, I think all this aligns the right way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is aligning for cryptocurrency. Donald Trump, while he's smacking around the IRS, <laughs> and they're doing, all, they're not going to have time to redirect and do this this way. I mean, it's hard enough to keep up with business as usual. Mm -hmm. Government shut down. People can't fill out tax forms or get taxes back. It's crazy. Oh yeah. Um, and if they really want to fight the Fed, that like it looks like they're doing right now, uh, that will be good for businesses as well who use cryptocurrency. Right. Uh, Ryan Cooper said, 28 days later, bend thy knee. Oh, hilarious. <laughs> I mean, listen, that would be a scare. If you all woke up, and you know what's going to happen on a Wednesday, Thursday morning. You can quote us on it because they always do their, you know, little uh, laws that we never have a chance to vote on. The laws and bills we never, you know, even decide on. They tell us Wednesday mornings or Thursday mornings. So don't be surprised you wake up one morning and they're like, uh, yeah, if you ever traded crypto, you ain't tell us about it. You got 28 days. So <laughs> speaking of taxes, though. BitPay has partnered with Refundo to enable taxpayers to receive 
refunds in Bitcoin. What up? All right, Big, big Pay. We'll, we'll give, give you it. one. We'll give it to you, Big Yeah, give yeah. us a, all right, Big Pay. Yeah. You guys, listen, people, Big Pay has done an awesome job. They just don't care about the little people in crypto anymore. They only want yeah. big institutions. Uh, but this is a big move. Well, well, actually, I will say they did do a great job because for corporations and for institutional people, they need this type of infrastructure to feel safe enough to enter the market. Mm -hmm. Because before 2015, if you wanted to open a company and pay your employees, do your taxes and your payroll, you could not do it in cryptocurrency unless you did it manually. You would literally have to be able to track everything and do your taxes yourself. BitPay entered the picture uh, after that, um, and they actually came in and had uh, payments in Bitcoin. Then we did the story where they actually allow you to pay your taxes. They partnered with TurboTax. Now all the way to Refundo, wow. where you can actually get your tax refund in Bitcoin. Um, their new product is called Coin RT. It allows taxpayers to receive all or portion of the federal and state tax refunds in Bitcoin through BitPay's payout. So it would be the same, like they're paying um, their regular check. It would just go to BitPay and they would give it to you in Bitcoin. So that's a good service for certain people. I know some people would definitely use some of their refund for crypto instead and wouldn't have to you know, use an exchange. But there are some people that are like, well, if they're going full IRS tax accounting, we know where they stand. So good to see from BitPay, but very mixed reviews right now. Yeah, um, you know, and somebody just said it. Uh, Sergeant Crypto said, watch out, it's a trap. Oh, yeah. Uh, I would say I believe you because yeah. when we this talked about... Look perfect honey pot. Yeah, when they talk, yeah, really. When they talked about... Uh, when, we, when we went over TurboTax, we said the same thing because we know TurboTax, I mean, it's clearly in bed with the government. Mm -hmm. um, but... And as you said, BitPay has helped with crypto adoption. And I'll even throw them a bone. Honestly, I would say that the, the primary reason why they probably stopped uh, servicing or adding support for basically small operations, mom and pops and the like, is because uh, they don't have enough people. You yeah. know, we just went through a bear market. I'm sure they didn't have enough, you know, they're not about to hire a bunch of people and say, we're going to service the institutions and the retail investors. And again, as we told you all before, the government does not want retail investors, i.e. mom and pops, i.e. poor people uh, into crypto. They only want wealthy people and institutions. So I'm sure BitPay got that tap on the shoulder uh, where they were told the same thing. They're like, no problem. We'll go over here. Uh, and that's what they're doing. But as you said, the good thing about it is, you know, spreading that adoption. But mm -hmm. um, as far as them, you know, doing the tax stuff and receiving Bitcoin, I wouldn't do it through BitPay, people. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. And if you do do it, just know you have 28 days to bend thy <laughs> knee, as Ryan Cooper Pretty said much, afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because that would clearly show the government. It's like, oh, so you definitely do stuff in Bitcoin. All mm -hmm. right. We know for sure you at least got one in there. So yep. uh, let us get it. <laughs> All right. Other than that, what are we doing for the free cryptic coin today? Oh, yeah. So for our free cryptic coin... Our question about the tax refund uh, service we just stated, Refundo. Would you get a tax refund in Bitcoin? Would you allow part of it, portion, or all of it to be in cryptocurrency? Let us know what you think. Put that cryptic coin address and we'll send the free coins to that winner. Sounds good. As always, thank you for watching. Have a happy Tuesday. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe if you have not already. And tag that bell right next to it to make sure you get these notifications. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers.